Hello, my name is Van de Keizer, and this is a presentation on the basics of brain tumor imaging. So the goal of this presentation is to teach you everything you have to know to start diagnosing or providing a differential diagnosis for a neoplastic brain tumor. And I hope to do this in half an hour. I don't know if I'll succeed, but that's the goal. So let's start with a very short introduction the absolute basics of brain tumors. What do you need to know? Well, you can divide them into two very broad categories. You have primary brain tumors, which are tumors that originate uh, directly from the brain or the surrounding brain structures, such as the meninges or the cranial nerves. And you have secondary brain tumors, which are tumors that have metastasized from primary brain tumors, uh, primary tumors elsewhere in the body. For instance, a primary lung tumor or a primary breast tumor that has metastasized to the brain. So if we then look at the group of primary brain tumors, we will see that there are an awful lot of them. This is from the latest WHO 2021 classification on primary brain tumors, and there are over a hundred different kinds of tumors included. So it seems impossible to know them all, and well, nothing is impossible, but it's not necessary to know them all. Because despite the fact this is a very extensive list, in daily practice and daily radiological practice, only a small group of tumors will constitute the majority of brain tumors with which we as radiologists are confronted on uh, the scans that we see every day. And a lot of these tumors included in the list are so rare that most radiologists won't ever see them or will only see like one of them uh, in the course of their entire career. But first things first, before we jump to the diagnosis or differential diagnosis, what should you do when you are for the first time confronted with a space occupying lesion on imaging? Well, the first thing you should do is do not worry about the differential diagnosis or the diagnosis at all. It's a space occupying mass lesion. Instead, you should rule out uh, potential emergencies. Uh, situations in which urgent uh, neurosurgical intervention is necessary. And what are those? Those are mass effects leading to uh, subfalcine or transtentorial herniation and hydrocephalus. So let's show you an example. This is a patient who presented at the ER due to headache, decreased level of consciousness, some neurological deficits, and so on and so on. And what do we see on non-enhanced CT images of the brain? We see an isodense brain tumor centered in the region of the right thalamus, surrounded by a lot of edema. And what else do we see? If we draw a line along the uh, course of the falx cerebri, where it should normally uh, run or be found, we see that the septum pellucidum that uh, is normally situated along the midline has deviated to the left. So this is a midline shift to the contralateral side, which is associated with a herniation of brain parenchyma underneath the falx cerebri, a so-called subfalcine herniation. So you should always report your midline shift and the uh, presence of a subfalcine, subfalcine herniation. A second thing you should look for is this is the same patient. Once again, we see the tumor surrounded by edema, but look at the level of the basal cisterns. Normally, you should see around the mesencephalon, which uh, I drew here for you, you should plainly see the perimesencephalic cisterns, but that's not possible here because they are narrowed and sometimes completely effaced. We see part of the quadrigeminal cistern, but that's about it. Also look at the morphology of the mesencephalon. The mesencephalon looks flattened and deformed. And why is that? Because brain tissue is herniating from the right temporal lobe through the tentorial notch and is compressing the mesencephalon. Let's look at, here is some text describing what I just said. Let's look at the same thing in the coronal and sagittal plane. In the coronal plane, we clearly see the brain tumor surrounded by edema and we see uh, if you look carefully, you see this small dense line. This is the tentorium cerebelli, and we see that the brain tumor and the udimatous brain tissue is herniating above the tentorium through the tentorial notch 
and compressing the brainstem. Also look at the sagittal images. Normally, you should clearly see the mesencephalon, and above the mesencephalon, you normally find the third ventricle. Not the case here. What we are looking at is pudimatous brain tissue uh, and a brain tumor that have herniated to the tentorial notch and cause compression of the mesencephalon. So another example of transtentorial herniation. Then uh, what other uh, possible uh, emergency should you report? Uh, that's the presence of a hydrocephalus. This is a patient who presented at the ER because of progressive headache associated with vomiting, especially early in the morning. And what do we see on the axial plane? We see clear distension. This was a young patient, uh, late 20s, early 30s. Um, I believe, and we see that there is a clear dilatation of the lateral ventricles and the axial plane and the sagittal plane. We see also dilatation of the lateral ventricles, also of the third ventricle, but the caliber of the fourth ventricle is normal. And why is that? Because this patient suffers from an obstructive supratentorial hydrocephalus due to the presence of a dense mass lesion in the region of the pineal gland. And this was a primary pineal gland tumor, a so-called pineoblastoma, which is a very malignant brain tumor. Another thing you should worry about or worry you should ask yourself is, what am I looking at here exactly? Is this truly a neoplastic uh, tumor or is it something else? Because not every lesion associated uh, with mass effect will be a neoplastic brain tumor. Uh, two of the most frequent findings in patients presenting at the ER are ischemic strokes and um, spontaneous cerebral hemorrhages, and these can sometimes look like tumors. For instance, in this patient, this was an oncological patient presenting with headache, vomiting, signs of increased intracranial pressure, and we see that the left cerebellar hemisphere is clearly swollen and hypodense due to edema. Because of the clinical presentation and the oncological history, uh, it was immediately believed that this would be due to a brain tumor, but that wasn't the case. And if you look at the sagittal images, we see that there is a clear and very sharp demarcation from the area that is hypodense from the area that is still normal. And this corresponds to the vascular territories of the cerebellum. This is the pica territory, and this is the territory of the superior cerebellar artery. In other words, we are looking at a subacute pica infarction leading to massive swelling and edema of the left cerebellar hemisphere, but respecting the vascular territories. Uh, and this is the, these are the MRI findings in a patient who had who also had a pica infarction, not the same patient, but on T2 and flare, we see clear edema of the left cerebellar hemisphere associated with diffusion restriction. This is another patient who presented with acute aphasia, also had an oncological history. And the question is, we are looking at areas of edema, but what exactly is due to a brain tumor? What is an ischemic stroke? Is everything we're looking at due to a brain tumor? Is everything stroke? Hard to tell, or is it? Well, let's look a little bit carefully. I messed up here, let's ignore that. Okay, here we see an area of edema in the right frontal lobe, but notice that, well, I won't tell you yet. And here we see an other area of edema in the left parietotemporal transitional area. If we look at a somewhat higher slice, we see that the area of edema in the right frontal lobe has an inlying hyperdense lesion, and this was a metastasis. We don't see a similar hyperdense lesion and the uh, left parietotemporal area. So the question is, is this still due to a um, CT graphically occult uh, metastasis or is this an ischemic stroke? Can we tell the difference? Well, actually we can even on CT. If you look at this area of edema, we see that the cortex is spared. And in va uh, vasogenic edema, which is often uh, surrounding, uh, a brain tumor, uh, this will never involve the cerebral cortex. In ischemic stroke, on the other hand, the cortex, which contains neurons that need a lot of energy and are, as a consequence, very vulnerable to situations in which the delivery of oxygen is interrupted, while the cortex will always be, or practically always be, involved in a territorial ischemic infarction, 
as was the case here. So yes, we can kind of tell the difference based on the involvement of the cortex, yes or no. This was vasogenic edema due to a brain tumor, and this was cytotoxic edema due to an ischemic stroke. Mind you, the concepts vasogenic edema and cytotoxic edema are basically MRI concepts, so I try to avoid using those terms when describing a CT, but that's just me. Uh, Dan, another reason patients uh, present at the ER is uh, because of spontaneous cerebral hemorrhages, and these can be primary, for instance, a hypertensive hemorrhage or a hemorrhage due to cerebral amyloid angiopathy, or they can be secondary due to, for instance, an underlying brain tumor. When should you suspect a brain tumor? Well, let's look at these two patients who both presented with lower, superficially located uh, brain hemorrhages. Uh, and the right par left parietal lobe and the left frontal lobe, uh, this and the other patient. So in the patient with the hemorrhage and the left parietal lobe, we see some edema surrounding the hemorrhage, and we also see edema surrounding the hemorrhage in the left frontal lobe and the other patient, and notice that in this case, it's a bit of edema. In this case, it's a lot of edema. And when should you consider the possibility of an underlying tumor or a hemorrhagic tumor, when you have a lot of edema surrounding the hemorrhage, disproportionate for the size of the hemorrhage, which clearly is the case over here. We have a lot of edema and also look at uh, centrally what the hemorrhage looks like. It's a bit irregular and a bit hypodense, which is strange for a hemorrhage. This is also suspicious for a possible tumor. MRI was performed. We see an enhancing lesion, irregularly enhancing lesion in the left frontal lobe with a lot of edema. And the patient had a primary lung tumor, which unfortunately has metastasized to the brain. Okay, so we ruled out acute emergencies. We took some time to consider the possibility of a non-neoplastic lesion when looking at the CT findings. The next step is generally uh, MRI, uh, although you can already start considering uh, the differential diagnosis on CT. Well, differential diagnosis of brain tumors. My approach is always as follows. follows. I ask myself three questions, and the first two are the most important ones. And for the first two, you don't need to look at your images at all. The first two questions are, how old is the patient? And where is the tumor located? Now, simply based on those two questions, you can really narrow your differential diagnosis. Then the last question, which is the one uh, most people start with, is what does a tumor look like? But that's the least important one. Let's start with how old is the patient? And the main distinction for me is between children and adults. So of course, you have some variability, you know, the kind of brain tumor you'll see in a young adult or a middle-aged adult are still somewhat different than those you see in a geriatric patient. But let's ignore that for the moment. Let's just make a distinction between children and adults. And what do we see? Well, if we just look at a distribution of primary versus secondary brain tumors, we see that metastases are very rare in children over almost all brain tumors or primary brain tumors in a child. Metastasis can occur and generally due to neuroblastoma when that's the case, but that's a very small group of tumors in children. And adults, on the other hand, metastases constitute about 40 to 60% of brain tumors. So if you see a brain tumor in an adult, no matter where or what or whatever, you already have a chance of like 50%, it's going to be a metastasis. And that will be higher, that number, in older patients, older adults compared to younger adults. Let's look at a distribution of primary uh, brain tumors in children and adults. Just take a look at those pie charts. Do not analyze them. You see that the colors and the distributions are totally different between the two groups. And that's because the spectrum of primary brain tumors that is seen in children is completely different from that you see in adults. So basically, you just need to know the age of the patient and you just need to have an idea of what are the five most frequent kind of tumors in this specific age group to already have a very good differential diagnosis without having looked at the images. So what's the most frequent tumor in adults? Well, self-evidently brain metastases. Now let's look at primary brain tumors. What are the most frequent primary brain tumors in adults? Well, meningiomas are the most frequent primary brain tumor in adults. 
uh, followed by uh, gliomas, and the majority of gliomas in adult patients will be glioblastoma. So glioblastoma is very frequent in adults. Then we have cellular tumors, and most cellular tumor in adults are pituitary adenomas. And the last group that is pretty frequent in adults are the nerve sheet tumors. And once again, the majority of nerve sheet tumors in adults will be schwannomas. So we have five tumors in adults, brain metastases, meningioma, glioblastoma, pituitary adenoma, and schwannoma. And these constitute for like the majority of brain tumors in adults. So if you just know these five, you're already a long way. Um, then what other tumors are that are typical for adults? We have some other malignant and non-malignant tumors. Of the non-malignant tumors, hemangioblastoma as a typical adult brain tumor. You will never see it in children. Or central nervous system lymphoma, also a typical tumor of older adults. And in the group of gliomas, we also have oligodendroglioma and astrocytoma, which are typical adult brain tumors. Now let's do the same thing for pediatric brain tumors. I already told you we will see a totally different group of tumors here. Metastasis is no longer to be seen in the top five. Uh, we start with gliomas and glioneuronal tumors, but that's a very broad, heterogeneous group of tumors. Within that group, pilocytic astrocytomas, which are very benign tumors, are the most frequent one. And pilocytic astrocytomas are the most frequent benign brain tumor in children and basically the most frequent kind of tumor in children. Then we still have a pretty large group of gliomas that are not pilocytic astrocytomas. And the biggest subgroups are the low-grade and high-grade diffuse pediatric gliomas. But these are composed of several subtypes. Then we have the embryonal tumors, also a very important group. We don't see these in adults. Well, we can sometimes see a medulloblastoma in adults but uh, that's not very frequent. While in children, embryonal tumors constitute about 10% of brain tumors. So it's a pretty big group. And the most important and the most frequent uh, representative of this group is the so-called medulloblastoma. Then we have cellular tumors, also not infrequent in children, but what we see in children is different from adults. In adults, we mainly see pituitary adenomas. In children, we mainly see craniopharyngiomas. And then uh, for a last pretty small group of tumors, we have the ependymomas, which belong to the gliomas. And then we have several subgroups. Uh, meningiomas and nerve sheet tumors are not frequent in children, contrary to, that, to what we see in adults. And then we have several groups of tumors that are very specific or very typical for children, the germ cell tumors, choroid plexus tumors, pineal region tumors, and then a whole group of other tumors. So if you just answered the question with how old is the patient, is it a child or is it an adult, we have a list of five for each age group, uh, frequent brain tumors, and that list is completely different. So always start with what age is my patient? And then the second question is, where is the tumor located? And when I ask myself that question, you can answer that very specific. So it's located in the left frontal lobe, it's located in the pineal gland, it's located in the fourth ventricle. But I just want a very broad answer. Is the tumor located inside or outside the brain parenchyma? A tumor that is located inside the brain parenchyma is called an intraaxial brain tumor. And a tumor that is located outside the brain parenchyma is called an extraaxial brain tumor. And the only thing we need to do is distinguish on our imaging study if a tumor is located in or outside the brain parenchyma. This is a meningioma. Meningiomas are the most frequent primary brain tumor in adults and the most frequent extraaxial brain tumor in adults. And this tumor has all the signs of an extraaxial brain tumor. Because the tumor has originated outside the brain parenchyma, the tumor compresses the brain parenchyma, and we see a very small cleft filled with cerebrospinal fluid, so it is T2 hyperintense between the, between the tumor and the brain parenchyma. We see some widening of the cerebrospinal spaces, uh, fluid spaces between the brain parenchyma and the tumor, a so-called CSF meniscus, 
we see a small vessel between the tumor and the brain parenchyma located in the subarachnoid space, and we see flattened cortex underneath the tumor. The CSF cleft sign is the most reliable sign of an extra or the extra axial location of a brain tumor. So always look for a CSF cleft sign uh, when first confronted with a, a brain tumor to determine if it's located inside or outside the brain parenchyma. And if you do that, so you look at the tumor as extra axial or intra axial, your differential diagnosis is once again very narrow. If the tumor is located extra axially outside the brain parenchyma, it will either be a meningioma or a schwannoma. If the tumor is located inside the brain parenchyma, it will be a metastasis or a glioblastoma. And then we have some other typical adult tumors like lymphoma, astrocytoma, oligodendroglioma, hemangioblastoma for the intraaxial ones, and dural metastasis, solitary fibrous tumor, and epidermoid cysts, which are not neoplastic lesions but congenital cysts, but never mind that, for extraaxial brain tumors. But ignore those, focus just on the most frequent ones. And let's uh, show you some examples. Let's assume we are dealing with an adult patient and the patient has an intraaxial tumor. Well, then there is like 70% chance that it's either going to be a metastasis or a glioblastoma. And metastases are often, but not always, multifocal tumors. They can be solitary in about 25 to 50%, so that's not that infrequent either. And because they have spread hematogeneously to the brain parenchyma, they are often they are often found in the border zones, the watershed areas between the territories of the anterior, middle, and posterior cerebral arteries. So I drew the territories here, and you can see that the tumors are mainly located along the watershed areas. Now. Metastasis, the question, what does a tumor look like, is not that important for metastases because they can look like anything, to be honest. They, uh, on the upper side, uh, upper row, you see T2-weighted images, here you see T1-weighted images with gadolinium. The tumor can be almost entirely solid, surrounded by a lot of edema with some central necrotic components. The tumor can be largely necrotic. We see some faint rim enhancement. And the center of the tumor is not kistic, but seems to be some kind of debris, so it's a central necrotic tumor. Uh, this is a purely kistic tumor. The signal intensity is almost or is similar to that of cerebrospinal fluid, and there is a very thin peripheral enhancement. The tumor can be hemorrhagic. We see a hemorrhagic fluid level on T2-weighted images and a predominant T1 hyperintense signal, and the tumor can even be spontaneous Spontaneously T1 hyperintense, these are not contrast enhanced images in the case of melanoma metastases. So it can look like a lot of things, and especially larger metastases are often surrounded by a lot of edema, as indicated by the orange arrows over here. Uh, so the main other intraaxial brain tumor in adults would be glioblastoma. And glioblastomas often present as a large central necrotic mass. Uh, it may contain some hemorrhage, as you can see on these T2 star-weighted images. It's often surrounded by edema, just like metastases. Uh, also notice the central necrosis over here, and is associated with hyperperfusion on perfusion-weighted images. This is a typical location for glioblastomas, but they do not only occur there. Uh, this is a so-called butterfly glioblastoma located centrally in the corpus callosum. This is another example of a butterfly glioblastoma crossing the midline. For um, metastases, this is not a typical location. This is not a watershed area. And this is still another example of a butterfly glioblastoma crossing the midline. Notice the central necrosis of the tumor on the T1-weighted images with gadolinium. So we have seen examples of brain metastases and glioblastoma. What if a tumor is extra axial? Well, then there is about 80% chance that it's going to be a meningioma or schwannoma, and the differential is not that difficult. These are all meningiomas, and notice the beautiful cleft sign present in each and every tumor. Mind you, it will not always be this easy. I took the nicest examples to illustrate the CSF cleft sign. And this is a cerebellar convexity meningioma. This is a cerebellar pontine angle meningioma. This is an olfactory groove meningioma. 
This is a convexity meningioma located along the left temporal lobe and once again, an olfactory groove meningioma. Um, meningiomas can basically be located anywhere, anywhere where you have meninges, but the majority are located supracantorially. Uh, typical locations are along the cere cerebral convexities, along the falcs, or along the intersection of the convexity with the falcs, in which case we call them parasagittal meningiomas. They can be located along the skull base, like at the region of the olfactory groove, uh, at the back of the sphenoid wing, and here on the uh, sphenoid plate extending in the supracellar cistern. A minority are located infratentorially with typical locations, the back of the petrous bone, which often, and the clivus, which often extends into the cavernous sinus, a so-called petroclival meningioma. This is a cerebellopontine angle meningioma, a cerebellar convexity meningioma, and lastly, a foramen magnum meningioma. So they can be located practically anywhere, contrary to schwannomas, which are always located along the course of a cranial nerve. So they do not course supratentorially, and we don't have schwannomas along the course of the olfactory nerve and the optic nerve because these are not surrounded by Schwann cells. So we find most intracranial schwannomas uh, infratentorially uh, in the region of the basal cisterns. And the majority of schwannomas originate along the course of the vestibulocochlear nerve, about 80 to 90% of cases. So basically the majority of vestibular schwannomas are found in the region of the cerebellopontine angle, as we can see here in this tumor, which has grown nicely along the course of the vestibulocochlear nerve. Here are examples of other schwannomas, not vestibulocochlear schwannomas. We see a tumor here. These are high resolution P2 weighted images. Look at a tumor. It's a tumor composed of two parts, which is a bit bizarre, but okay, that's what it is. And the tumor was located along the course of the olfactory nerve. And this, this was an olfactory, uh, sorry, the oculomotor nerve. And this was an oculomotor schwannoma. This is a tumor located in a very specific location. This is the contralateral uh, meckel scape, not containing tumor. This tumor is located in a meckel scape, contains some central necrosis, which we often see in very large schwannomas. And this was a trigeminal schwannoma. And lastly, this is an unenhanced T1-weighted image. We see a very large tumor, and this tumor has grown along the course of the, well, it's difficult to say which one exactly because we have three cranial nerves running here, uh, the glossopharyngeal, vagus, and accessory nerve. And because the tumor is mainly located in the region of the jugular foramen, we have, we call it a jugular schwannoma, but we're not 100% sure which nerve the tumor originated from exactly, but it's a schwannoma. So all in all, when dealing with an extra axial brain tumor, we have two important possibilities in an adult, meningiomas and schwannomas, and the distinction is quite easy. Meningiomas can occur anywhere and have a broad dural base generally, while schwannomas will only be found along the course of a cranial nerve, which in 90% of cases will be the vestibulocochlear nerve. Now, the only differential diagnostic problem arises when we have a tumor arising in the region of the cerebellopontine angle. How can we make the difference between a meningioma or a schwannoma then? Well, meningiomas will still have a very broad dural base, which we will not see in uh, vestibulocochlear schwannomas, and they seem to have grown, um, well, basically uh, along out of the dura, while a vestibulocochlear schwannoma does not have a broad dural base or a broad dural attachment and just follows the course of the vestibulocochlear nerve. And when large, often contains some areas of necrosis. And if that is not sufficient to make a reliable distinction, just use statistics. Statistics are your friend. The majority of cerebellopontine angle tumors or vestibular schwannomas, about 80% of CPA tumors or schwannomas, and CPA meningiomas are less frequent. Meningiomas form only 10% of CPA tumors. So we have answered two questions already. How old is the patient? Where is the tumor located? The last question is the least important one. What does the tumor look like? 
Why is it not important? Because tumors can have a, the same tumor can have a, a lot of different imaging appearances. And because a lot of tumors also look similar, uh, let's say that this is what your standard tumor looks like. We have a solitary lesion that is hypodense on CT. It is hypointense on T1 and hyperintense on T2. Uh, after gadolinium administration, it can show enhancement or it can not show enhancement. And that's not really that helpful, contrary to what is often believed in the differential diagnosis. And the tumor has no diffusion restriction. And this is basically your run-of-the-mill tumor. So when it comes to the question, what does a tumor look like? You have to look for signs that are basically a bit more specific. Let's start with how many lesions do we have? There's a difference in the differential diagnosis if we're dealing with a solitary brain tumor or a multifocal tumor. Uh, what does a tumor look like on CT, T1, T2, and so on? I will go over those one by one. So let's start with the question, how many lesions do we have? Is it a solitary process or multifocal? Well, the differential diagnosis of a multifocal uh, brain tumor is quite limited and consists of cerebral metastases, self-evidently, but also CNS lymphoma. Lymphoma is uh, multifocal in about 35 to 40% of cases. So CNS lymphoma can be a solitary tumor, but is often a multifocal disease. And also, multifocality can occur in glioblastoma. This is a multifocal glioblastoma, and up to 10% of glioblastomas uh, are multifocal. There are multiple contrast-enhancing uh, lesions uh, originating from the glioblastoma. And the main non-neoplastic differential diagnosis would be with infectious disease. Uh, for instance, uh, fungal abscesses in an immunocompromised patient. Now, what does a tumor look like? Most tumors are hypodense on CT because they contain more water. So we look at tumors that contain non-hypodensities like calcifications or hemorrhage, or that are just hyperdense on their own. Now, these are tumors containing calcifications, and the most important tumors associated with tumoral calcifications would be meningiomas. So if you have an extra axial tumor with calcifications, very likely it's a meningioma. This is another example of an olfactory groove meningioma that is almost completely calcified. If you see a tumor in the cellar and supracellar region with calcifications, it's probably going to be a craniopharyngioma because 90% of uh, craniopharyngiomas of the adamantinomatous subtype, we'll get it again, uh, contain calcifications. And lastly, if you have an intraaxial brain tumor containing some calcifications, and especially if it's located in the region of the corticomedullary junction area, it's probably going to be an oligodendroglioma. Uh, so remember those extraaxial tumor with calcifications, meningioma, cellular to supracellular tumor with calcifications, craniopharyngioma, and intraaxial corticomedullary tumor with uh, calcifications, oligodendroglioma. Now, what if a tumor is spontaneously dense on CT? Then you should definitely consider the possibility of a CNS lymphoma. If the tumor is located in the pineal uh, gland region, it can be a pineoblastoma or will probably be a pineoblastoma. And if the tumor is located in the posterior fossa, especially in children, but they also can occur in adults, it's probably going to be a medulloblastoma. And why are these tumors dense on CT? Because these are hypercellular tumors. They do not contain that much water because they have narrow intercellular spaces. And as a consequence, their density is increased on CT. And these are generally more malignant tumors or pretty malignant tumors. Pineoblastoma and medulloblastoma are highly aggressive and CNS lymphoma is as well. So let's uh, go from CT to MRI. Most brain tumors are hypointense on T1 and hyperintense on T2. So for the differential diagnosis, it's pretty cool if a tumor is T1 hyperintense and or T2 hypointense because the differential diagnosis is more limited. Let's suppose a tumor is T1 hyperintense or has T1 hyperintense components. What are the reasons that a lesion is T1 hyperintense can be due to the uh, presence of fluid that is rich in proteins, 
and there are several entities associated with protein-rich cysts. One of them is cranioparangioma. So if you have a multicystic lesion in the cellular and supracellular region that has T1 hyperintense cysts, it's probably going to be craniopharyngioma. Another example is a colloid cyst, which is non-neoplastic, it's a congenital cyst. Uh, what is also T1 hyperintense a hemorrhage. So a hemorrhagic tumor is definitely a possibility, like a hemorrhagic metastasis in this case. A tumor can be spontaneously T1 hyperintense due to the presence of melanin. So melanoma metastasis are a possibility. And it can be T1 hyperintense due to the presence of fat, like, for instance, in this dermoid cyst. So the differential diagnosis of T1 hyperintensity is limited, and as a consequence, also the uh, kind of tumors that are associated with T1 hyperintensity. Let's move on to what if a tumor is T2 hyperintense, like here. This is a CNS lymphoma, a hypercellular tumor, narrow intercellular spaces, so not a lot of uh, water molecules and the interstitium leading to a low T2 signal. This is a hemorrhagic tumor. Remember this case from the start of the presentation, which is pitch black on T2 weighted images, so hemorrhagic tumors, RT2 hypointense, and this was a metastasis from a colon carcinoma and tumors, uh, metastases from uh, primary tumors, which are, uh, let's say, uh, mucinous tend to be T2 hypointense. So hypercellular tumors, hemorrhagic tumors, and mucinous tumors can be hypointense on T2. Then contrast enhancement. Is contrast enhancement present or not? And if so, what is the pattern of contrast enhancement? First things first, what is contrast enhancement? Contrast enhancement just means that the blood-brain barrier is deficient. So it's not... It doesn't really mean that the tumor will be high grade because there is contrast enhancements, just that the tumor has areas that have a deficient blood-brain barrier, nothing more. And what can we see? What kind of patterns of enhancement are there? We can have no enhancement at all. We can have uniform enhancement. We can have a non-uniform heterogeneous enhancement, often due to areas of central necrosis. And we can have a peripheral thin cyst-like enhancement as we see here. And what's the differential diagnosis for each pattern? No enhancement is typically seen in astrocytoma and oligodendroglioma, although in oligodendroglioma, sometimes you can see a very small dot-like enhancement in about 50% of cases. Now, the fact that there is no enhancement or barely any enhancement seen does not mean that these will be low-grade tumors. These can still be WHO-grade 3 tumors, which makes them high-grade tumors. This is an example of so-called gliomatosis, which is uh, not a pathological concept, but more a descriptive concept. It's a glial tumor diffusely infiltrating the white matter, with a very infiltrative growth pattern, and we see no enhancement whatsoever. But that does not mean that this is a low-grade tumor. As a matter of fact, this was a WHO grade 4 tumor, which technically speaking makes this a glioblastoma. So remember, we have absence of contrast enhancement in several glial tumors, and in gliomatosis, but that does not automatically mean that these will be low-grade tumors. Then we have uniform enhancement, and typically seen in central nervous system lymphoma. It's so typical that I include two examples, and another typical tumor with homogeneous enhancement is meningioma. Uh, these are tumors with non-uniform, very heterogeneous enhancement, and that is more typically seen in very aggressive tumors that grow so fast that the center of the tumor does not receive enough blood uh, and starts to um, become necrotic. Examples are metastases and glioblastoma uh, in adults. And in children, when you see a central necrotic tumor, you have to think of something very aggressive. The, di the differential will still be pretty broad, but includes, for instance, atypical teratoid rhabdoid tumors, as was the case here, and other embryonal tumors or anaplastic ependymomas. Anyways, aggressive high-grade tumors should be in your differential. Now, the differential for tumors with thin, almost peripheral cyst-like enhancement is a very broad, but the two you have to consider um, 
at first are the ones that are the most frequent, and that is glioblastoma. So you can have cystic glioblastomas, just as you can have cystic metastases. And when it comes to a non-neoplastic process, consider the possibility of a cerebral abscess. This is a very specific uh, enhancement pattern, the so-called contrast-enhancing nodule plus cyst pattern. And it has a very limited differential diagnosis, so it's uh, pretty cool if you see it. If you see these tumors in a child, so a tumor consisting of an enhancing nodule with a large cyst, uh, this will be a pilocytic astrocytoma. If you see it in an adult, let's say uh, 40 years old, it's going to be a hemangioblastoma. Be careful though, metastases are the most frequent tumors in adults and they can have very heterogeneous imaging appearances. So every now and then you can have a metastasis that looks a bit like a mural nodule plus cyst. How do we know that this is not hemangioblastoma? Because in hemangioblastoma, the cyst wall is never enhancing as it was here. So this was a sign that it is not hemangioblastoma and this was a cerebellar metastasis. Then if you see the mural nodule plus cyst pattern supratentorially, differential diagnosis is limited as well. It can be a ganglioglioma, which is a very benign glioneuronal tumor. So it contains both glial elements and neuronal elements, and it's typically located in the cortex. We most often find these tumors in the temporal lobe, where they are classically associated with epilepsy. Another example is pleomorphic astrocytoma, and the tumor can look indistinguishable from ganglioglioma, also typically located in the cortex and also uh, with a preferential location in the temporal lobe. And the last one is pilocytic astrocytoma. When you find them supratentorially, the patient will often be older. If you see pilocytic astrocytomas in adults, uh, and they are not that frequent in adults, uh, they are uh, generally located in the supratentorial brain parenchyma, but can also have this cyst plus nodule appearance. So, and here we see some arrows pointing to the cortical base of the ganglioglioma and pleomorphic xanthoastrocytoma. So, we are almost there. What does the tumor look like on diffusion? Uh, these are tumors associated with diffusion restriction. We have a large tumor in the fourth ventricle, but we start with the tumor and the splenium of the corpus callosum. This tumor was a CNS lymphoma, and lymphomas are often located uh, near CSF-containing spaces like the ventricles or the pile surface of the brain. So the periventricular white matter and the corpus callosum are a preferential location for CNS lymphomas. This was a pineoblastoma. Pineoblastoma is also a very cellular tumor, so it's uh, often associated with diffusion restriction, and this was a medulloblastoma, a tumor located in the fourth ventricle of a child with diffusion restriction, definitely think medulloblastoma. Um, then these are some tumor mimics associated with diffusion restriction. Uh, this here was a brain abscess, and brain abscesses tend to have a very homogeneous diffusion restriction because they are filled with a viscous material, namely pus, this was a non-enhancing, you have to believe me, I'm not showing the images, T2 hyperintense cystic appearing lesion located uh, in the midline um, associated with diffusion restriction. And this is an epidermoid cyst. And epidermoid cysts are basically congenital cysts that can gradually enlarge over many, many years, years to even decades due to the chronic shedding of keratin and debris in the tumor. And lastly, we have uh, a lower hemorrhage over here associated with diffusion restriction because a blood clot is diffusion restricted, is very viscous. So keep in mind, if you see a space, occupy, space occupying lesion with diffusion restriction, it can also be one of these non-tumoral entities. And lastly, what do we see on perfusion MRI? Well, generally speaking, I don't really need perfusion MRI. Well, it's rarely... Um, something that will change your diagnosis, but it's a useful tool in the follow-up of brain tumors, especially in high-grade brain tumors that have been um, received radiation therapy. Uh, but if you do perfusion MRI, uh, 
for diagn diagnostic purposes. These are all tumors associated with hyperperfusion, so an increased perfusion. And what does that mean, increased perfusion? It means that these tumors have an increased microvascular density, so they have, they have more brain vessels than a normal brain parenchyma due to the process of neoangiogenesis, which is basically the new formation of blood vessels by the tumor. And what kind of tumors do that? Well, very aggressive, very malignant tumors like glioblastomas and other high-grade malignant tumors. These tumors were all glioblastomas, except for this one. This was a high-grade anaplastic ependymoma in a child. Uh, these are tumors without hyperperfusion because they are not associated with neoangiogenesis. Uh, CNS lymphoma generally has no hyperperfusion. Uh, Low-grade astrocytoma, WHO grade 2, typically has no hyperperfusion. And this is why we like to do MRI perfusion in the follow-up. This patient had a glioblastoma that was surgically removed. We see some remnants of the surgery over here. Uh, patient received radiation, and a couple of years later, he had this uh, rim-enhancing uh, process located in the left temporal lobe, and there was a lot of worry that this was... Um, a recurrence of the glioblastoma, but on the perfusion MRI, we see no hyperperfusion, uh, quite a contrary. We see an area of no perfusion at all. This was an area of radiation necrosis. So these are, for me, the basics of tumor imaging, uh, brain tumor imaging. When confronted with a brain tumor, first rule out emergencies, then ask yourself, could this be a non-neoplastic entity? And if you have done that, you can start thinking about the diagnosis or differential diagnosis by asking yourself three questions. How old is the patient? Where is the tumor located? And what does the tumor look like? The question of how old is the patient will determine what kind of tumors you uh, will consider in your differential. And then you can narrow it even further based on the fact if a tumor is located inside or outside the brain parenchyma. And remember that uh, when it comes to tumors inside the brain parenchyma in adults, um, in about 70% of cases, you will deal with either metastases or glioblastoma. And if the tumor is extra actually located in an adult, 80% chance it's a meningioma or schwannoma. And then lastly, the last question, what does a tumor look like? A lot of tumors look alike, but look for a very specific imaging clues, like is it a solitary lesion or a multifocal lesion? Is it a lesion that contains calcifications or a lesion that is spontaneously dense on unenhanced CT? Is it a lesion with T1 hyperintense components, which could be hemorrhage, which could be fat, uh, which could be melanin or protein-rich fluid? Is it a T2 hypointense lesion, uh, for instance, a hemorrhagic brain tumor? What is the pattern of enhancement of the tumor? Is a tumor associated with diffusion restriction, such as several hypercellular tumors like lymphoma, medulloblastoma, pineoblastoma, and so on? And lastly, is a tumor associated with hyperperfusion? And if that's the case, it's probably going to be a high-grade tumor, a high-grade glial tumor. So this was a very quick presentation on uh, brain tumor imaging, the absolute basics, everything you need to know to get started. I hope you, find, uh, you found it useful. If you have any comments, questions, or feedback, uh, leave a comment in the comment section or send me an email, neuroradiology.online at gmail.com. Thank you very much for watching.